Welcome to the Center for U.S. War Veterans Oral Histories at the National Guard Militia Museum of New Jersey in Seagirt, a partner of the Library of Congress's Veterans History Project. Today is May 7th, 2015. I am Carol Fowler, Director of the Center. My honored veteran is Arthur A. Coppola, who served in World War II in the Asia Pacific Theater. He served with the United States Marine Corps and was a radar technician. 7th Field Depot, attached to 2nd and 4th Marine Divisions at Saipan, and to the 1st and 6th Marine Divisions at Okinawa. He was a radar technician. Also, he was a part of the occupation of China for four months. Later, he spent seven weeks assisting in Vietnam as a lieutenant colonel working on the elements of the homing beacon the helicopters needed. Um, and he was chosen to store and issue supplies with the field depot. Um, thank you for wanting to be here today, Art. Can I call you Art? Sure. Your eyewitness account is considered a primary historical source and a valuable contribution to the Veteran Oral History Project here at the National Guard Militia Museum. And good morning and welcome. Thank you. Hello. Okay. And we, today we are going to cover what we uh, didn't get to cover last time, and that was... After graduation from high school, uh, tell us about that free course. Oh, after I graduated from high school, uh, the government sponsored a, um, a two-month machine shop training course uh, so that it would prepare us for working in the war industry. And uh, Thomas A. Edison Labs in uh, Orange, New Jersey, uh, volunteered the equipment that uh, Thomas Edison actually used the machines that he used and are now museum pieces uh, to use them uh, for training, which we did for the two months. So I operated most of those machines that there are now on exhibit. And this was part of a war immobilization program? Yes, and then after that uh, I applied for a job in the uh, a shipyard that just opened up in Port Newark, New Jersey, an adjunct of the Kearney shipyards. And this shipyard was a temporary one, just set up for the war. Uh, to man I guess now I look back to manufacture a number of landing craft infantry, which I understand now, I didn't know then, that it was going to be used in the Normandy invasion. Uh, they put two of them on a way and uh, we finished both of them at the same time and they were launched the same day. And right after they were launched, uh, why uh, British and, and completed, uh, British crews were uh, bussed in and uh, to take them back to England. We assumed they're going to England being that they were British sailors. Unfortunately, uh, they tried to be waved and tried to be friendly as they came in on a bus and for some reason or another, I can't understand it, our own uh, workers there uh, booed them, didn't treat them very nicely. I, I was kind of disappointed on that because after all they were trying to be friendly to us. Right. But I guess uh, the war wasn't too popular until uh, That's right. Japan uh, got into involved in it uh, and that's the only way we would have gotten into the war because the American people had no stomach for fighting another World War I type oh, I see. thing. Right. Getting back to that machine shop training, um, the war mobilization program was to get people to work in war plants. Right. In other words, uh, they encouraged everyone uh, if they're going to get a job when they graduate, get it in a war industry. Interesting. And you were even given unemployment benefits while you were taking that course? Yes, because I worked for the telegraph office uh, uh, and the two months that I took that course, they even gave me unemployment uh, uh, benefits so I didn't suffer f from any money problems then. As a teenager, which is pretty interesting as well. Let's talk about that shipyard job. Yeah, the, um, 
What was your specific job you were hired to do? I was hired as a ship fitter's helper, and uh, then I got attached to a crew of about five or six who was responsible for setting up the uh, propeller shaft tubing that went from the engine room back to the skeg or back of the boats. And they put two of these landing craft inf uh, infantry LCIs on a way. They were about 150 feet each, and they both fit on them one way, two of them, one in front of the other. They would lay a keel down and bring in large sections of the uh, ship uh, boat uh, and uh, set them over the keel, and then our job was to fit them to the keel and fit them together like a crossword puzzle, you might say, or a Lego, maybe. Anyway, um, even though I was hired as a helper, I found myself uh, crawling into small four by four by four, I think, uh, what they call water tanks, which uh, through which the propeller shaft tube, the tube that surrounded the sh propeller shaft, uh, passed through. And each uh, bulkhead required a collar to make it waterproof. And I had to crawl in there with a light because it was pitch dark and uh, and fit the collar around the tube against the bulkhead and tack it welded because the welders usually they were, had a large stomach and didn't fit in there. And I, I was 18 and light, you might say, and able to uh, crawl in there much more easily. It was no problem for me. So you had to weld in there? Wasn't it dangerous? I had to even grab the welding apparatus uh, because the welder couldn't get in there and I would just tack weld it. And uh, What does that mean? Uh, just put short welds on it, just enough to hold the collar in place so that they could examine it because whenever we put something together on a ship, we only tack weld it. it many short uh, pieces of uh, strips of weld, it was electric welding, uh, so just enough to hold the parts together and uh, allow a, uh, an inspector to come and see if the joint was tight enough and uh, if the collar fitted uh, uh, well enough. After so, which a production welder would come in and he would then fill the, all the uh, parts that had to be welded, uh, uh, which was considerably more area than a tack welder did. Uh, I did this uh, uh, on, I guess, I must have worked on at least 40, 50 boats, maybe, uh, at East Landing Craft Infantry. Uh, there were two on a way, and there, I worked on six of the ways with this crew. And uh, that was uh, 12 at a, at a time. And uh, after we did a number of them, uh, then they started producing what they called destroyer escorts. Uh, these were twice as long as the uh, landing craft infantry, and I assumed that they were used for submarine war warfare to, to uh, uh, accompany the convoys and keep the submarines at bay. Uh, and uh, we worked on a number of then I did the same job on them as I did on the other. The college. Evidently, they used the same design uh, for the uh, propeller shaft tubing. And uh, in fact, one time I would crawl into one of the landing craft infantry and I found that the uh, keel in the front got separated by about an inch. And I reported that and they had to put reinforced plating on there to patch it up because uh, it would have buckled if uh, it was ever out at sea and hitting the waves. Oh. But anyway, we worked on a number of these uh, destroyer escorts before I finally decided that there was more to, in a world of sea than the inside of a mm -hmm. boat. And I got permission from the foreman to leave and went back to the draft board who's been hounding me every month finding out to find out whether I was still in the war industry or not. 
And you were in that for nine months? Uh, nine months. And, and All right, we already covered um, what you're about to talk about. So let's jump to um, when you were working for the federal government after the war. Well, I graduated from uh, New Jersey Institute of Technology uh, as an electrical engineer, right. bachelor of science. Uh, unfortunately, they didn't teach electronics. Uh, it was too new at the time, and I had to learn it on the job when I went to work at Fort Monmouth. Uh, the, uh, I was interviewed for the job before I graduated, and. Uh, what interested me most was uh, the work that they were doing on meteorological instrumentation in the uh, Evans, uh, uh, Camp Evans in Belmar, New Jersey, where I spent my first 15 years there working on meteorological equipment. I worked on um, first a uh, uh, parachute radio sign, AMT-6, which um, was uh, used by extensively by the Air Force because the Cold War was on and uh, they wanted uh, atmospheric data in parts of the world where they couldn't launch balloons and also near enemy territory, not enemy, but uh, with the Cold War and territory that usually they, they weren't supposed to be in. And um, <clears throat> this is where I <clears throat> learned to um, learned the electronics. It took me uh, first year or two. It was kind of hectic because I knew only a little bit about it, what I learned in the military, and not enough. But it was the military training that I had in radar, uh, as a radar technician, that got me interested in electronics in the first place. And I, I kind of found my, found my field of what I should be doing when I did that. But anyway, uh, going back to the meteorological division, after I finished uh, finding all the problems they were having on a parachute radio sun, uh, we flew in B-29s up and down the coast to test them uh, from Asbury Park to Atlantic City and back. It had to be over the ocean in case the parachute didn't open on them. And, um, then the uh, Navy said, well, you're in our airspace. <laughs> <Get Hello. out." laughs> so we went down to, uh, I don't know what the name, I forget the name of the air, air base down in Pensacola, Florida. Uh, and uh, they had a range over the Gulf of Mexico where they can run the B-29s back and forth. We flew at 30,000 feet and dropped these. Uh, a lot of times we had to go on oxygen where you wear a mask and carry a oxygen bottle. At the end of the day, I felt like I carried a load of bricks up all day long on, a, on my back. When was that, back in the 60s? Yes. Uh, and uh, when, we've, uh, when I finished all the problems, uh, turned it over to contractors and, and the Air Force went, and I understand they, they bought quite a few of them and used them all over the world. I published a report on it, uh, but uh, they won't, even today, they won't allow it to be distributed uh, to the normal world cat, like uh, some other reports that I wrote. Um, but uh, when I finished that, uh, Russia launched Sputnik. So I was transferred to a group in the same outfit to um, to work on a satellite that, that the United States wanted to send up on a Vanguard satellite system. And they needed a, a transistor tape recorder because the power budget was very low and they needed transistors rather than tubes to, to operate. And there wasn't any transistor tape recorder ever made before, so it took me six months to design the electronics uh, to uh, make it work. And after that, I turned it over to them and worked on a, a ground tracking system with another fella uh, for the satellite for a while. Uh, then the group 
moved to NASA down in Bainbridge, Maryland, and uh, they asked me if I wanted to go, but I told them, no, my wife likes it up here in New Jersey, and I passed on that. Did she go down to Florida with you? I don't know how long you were down in Jacksonville, Florida. Did she go with you? No, I didn't go. I didn't oh. go to Bainbridge. No, it was Bainbridge, Maryland, that uh, NASA was located. And they wanted me to move there with them, but I uh, turned it down. So when I went back to the uh, group where I developed the drop sound or parachute radio sound, the Navy, the Navy board, uh, contracted with Atlantic Research on a six foot, four inch, five inch rocket uh, that would go up to 200,000 feet and eject the nose cone which was parachuted down. And uh, they asked uh, the Navy and the Air Force and the Army got together and funded me to uh, develop a uh, instrument nose cone using basically the uh, radio sod that they launched by balloon, but repackaging it to uh, fit into the nose cone. And this required uh, several modifications of the antenna, uh, power supply, and uh, and space, and, and I even had to add weight to it because I had to weight seven and a half pounds for the rocket to be balanced. Anyway, uh, and I, we built, I built, I had built in the uh, lab the first four or five models, and uh, we tested it out in White Sands, New Mexico and found that it worked, but the rocket needed work. Uh, the ejection, they used an explosive ejection device to separate the parachute and nose cone from the rocket motor, but it was too powerful and it was uh, causing, knocking the heck out of the instrument and causing frequency shift and stuff like that, that normally they claimed it was only going to be 25 G's of force, but it was a lot more than that. So we had them correct that. Uh, and also I found that I had the uh, temperature sensor on the thing uh, come flying out from the side uh, uh, when the nose cone separated. Uh, but due to the blast, it would break the element. So I had a, the laboratory uh, one of the fellows in the laboratory, the mechanical shop, uh, came up with a bellows. He says there was a bellows that was manufactured that we could put in there and delay the opening so that you avoid the blast, and that worked. Anyway, then we went on contract and had 68 of them built, and, uh, and they all worked. Uh, they all worked fine, and uh, we tested them at uh, uh, most of them at uh, Cape. Cape Canaveral, uh, also at the Air Force uh, base in uh, Pensacola and White Sands and uh, the Pacific Missile Range because the Navy was also in on the, on the development of this. They, they funded it along with the Air Force and the Army. Uh, and then uh, another person a woman engineer had uh, worked with a contractor to develop uh, what they call a hypsometer or a pressure measuring device which was designed to fit into the snow cone along with the uh, uh, the electronics from the uh, reconfigured radio sun so that uh, we could measure pressure and it was designed to get data up to 200 20,000 feet, whereas a balloon radio sound only went up to 110,000 feet, so it made twice the range. Then after that, the Navy came up with an idea of uh, uh, having a, what they call a, a falling sphere experiment, where the electronics is inside of a, a, a ball or a sphere about the size of maybe a, well, if it in a nose cone or a rocket. Uh, and it would free fall. So this required, oh, the ground equipment that I used to track this was the one that they used uh, for the balloon-borne radio sound, but I had to 
redesigned some of the features of it so that it would track a high-speed rocket instead of the slow-rising balloon. Uh, then the Navy wanted it to track the rocket up to, and this time they put a booster on the rocket so it would go to 500,000 500, feet. And, uh, and I had it redesigned the system again to track uh, it up to that altitude and I attached a seven track tape recorder to it because all the data was going to be obtained in about five minutes or less. Uh, it was going to go up to 500,000 feet in free fall and measure density, air density. And uh, we had to track it and the data had to be piecemealed back so I put it on a uh, slow, uh, on a fast running uh, tape and then it was played back slowly and right. we were able to determine what the data was. Mm -hmm. And when I finished that, um, I, uh, oh, I tried, I, I transferred to the avionics lab and, uh, and I went to the hexagon for that, which is about two miles out of Fort Monmouth Gate in, in Eatontown, New Jersey. And Cornell Lab developed this uh, computer program for modeling uh, uh, systems. Uh, you can say model a gas station and see whether you need more pumps or more operators, you know, depending on the queue of uh, people coming in for gas. Well, we applied the same, uh, I was asked to, a task to apply the same principles to developing a helicopter, for helicopter use, air traffic, uh, airspace regulation system, called ATAR. So, first I had to justify the program, get funding from Washington. Then I had to come up with a, uh, course of study that a contractor would do to develop the system and uh, it would have to be a contractor well versed in computers which I wasn't, it was new to me and I had to learn two languages, computer languages, a GPS, with one called GPSS, the other one called Fortran because one contractor used GPSS then when we went we let the contractor to another one. He decided he wanted to use Fortran, and I had to learn that. So I had to learn that. So I knew what they were doing. And uh, while we were, uh, while I was, then this went on for quite a while. And then there were a lot of other projects in between. Also, when I was in the Met Division, there were a lot of other projects too, in between the uh, meteorological instruments that I was talking about. There was a cloud cover and base indicator that, that I inherited because uh, they couldn't get it working and then I figured out what was wrong and got it working. I wrote a report on it and um, I wrote a memo on the uh, tape recorder work that I did too. Uh, I have that. Uh, Let's see, where was I? The yeah. Army used a navigation beacon system for yeah. helicopters? Well, I didn't get to that yet, but what happened was uh, I was working on uh, also a control tower that was uh, sheltered in a shelter and they would transport it to an airfield or a or landing base and use it as a control tower for helicopters coming in. But anyway, the system was being developed by uh, on contract and uh, while that was going on the Vietnam War was going on and and they sent a team they, they requested Vietnam requested uh, that a group of engineers go out there for three months at a time and uh, and help out or help solve problems and uh, well I, I did volunteer for that but then they said that they had a navigation beacon that wasn't working. They needed it, and they had a couple of fellows go out ahead of me, and the only thing they learned was that it had something to do with the very high temperatures that are on the ground, 115 degrees every day. Wow. Uh, on a delta area, which is at sea level. So 
I figured, well, I'll volunteer for the seven weeks. I won't go for three months, seven weeks, uh, if, um, and see if I can solve the problem. And being that it was a heat problem, I figured, well, I'll, I'll go borrow a heat gun when I'm out there and, and have a disassembled unit made, uh, a unit disassembled, and I would go over each part to see which one was sensitive to high heat. Uh, big mistake, I didn't bring the heat gun with me. Oh. When I went there, I found out that although there were uh, repair shops and stuff like that with equipment, it was not available to visitors because they needed it for their own work that they were doing. Very hard to get anything to um, uh, work with as far as instruments and test equipment and stuff like that. Much less even in the heat gun was hard to get. Well, I finally located one from the Air Force and, and uh, they had to borrow it and swear on a Bible that I'd bring it back. <laughs> anyway, uh, then they sent the contractor over and luckily he brought some spare parts with him. And uh, first he tried to find a problem and he didn't, then I asked him to lay out the instrument in a shelter, which was air conditioned, so we kept the temperature at an even deal. And first I put the heat on the transmitting transistors, and that didn't do it, but then when I put it on the frequency divider circuit cards that you, they slide in, um, that's where the problem was, and he had extra cards which we would test with the heat gun, and if they worked okay with the heat gun, then we could go out in the field and get all these instruments that were not working back to work, and we did about eight of them before we left. And you did all that with the heat gun that you borrowed from the Air Force? Yeah. So uh, that's all it needed, and, uh, wow. and, and for months they had this problem, and uh, nobody, this, you know, this is common sense. I can understand why somebody didn't do this before I did. Oh, they were lucky to have you. <laughs> Let's talk about when you traveled there. Um, you made some stops on Pacific Islands. Did yeah, they remind uh, you of World War II? Yeah, we landed, uh, well, first, uh, when, when, I, when, when I went out there, uh, I took a plane from Newark to San Francisco, and then uh, we took an Air Force, uh, I don't know if it was a commercial or an Air Force plane, but uh, we stopped at Hawaii and Kwajalein, that's what I remember, but then I don't remember some other islands as well. And then we landed in Thompson Hood Airport, Air Airport in an office near Saigon in uh, Vietnam. Where in Hawaii? Oh. Oahu, where you were as a Marine? Oahu, I believe it was, yeah. Wow, so did it look different to you than? Well, I, it was nighttime. Oh, okay. And uh, I didn't see anything on any of these islands. It was dark and I was sleeping most of the time on the way because it was dark and I it was sleep time. Okay, so Tonson Airfield in Saigon, Vietnam. By then it was afternoon. Yeah. And the first thing that hit me was a heat wave, 115 degrees. Human. And I understand it was that way every day. <laughs> and you weren't used to it because as a Marine, it you didn't May. have the... It was May, and it was right. just getting over winter. And, uh, and uh, also, what a smell. <laughs> it had its own character. I can't describe it. Uh, it was, uh, I guess if you go to some uh, underdeveloped countries, uh, they all have a different odor and this one uh, immediately caught my nose and eventually infiltrated my clothes and my skin. And wow. But I got used to it after a while. I didn't smell it anymore. Really? So <laughs> and, that's unlike anything you had as a Marine in World War II. Right. right. No place no, really smelled uh, The like smell that? was different in the Marine Corps. Oh. The Marine Corps, it was uh, decay. Oh, I remember I you talked decay, about that. Yeah. You're right. Uh, anyway, uh, you rented a hotel room. In, oh, sorry, Saigon. Yeah, and then uh, it took me about a, a week to get used to the twelve-hour difference in time. Oh, okay. Uh, it was Jet miserable, lag. you know, the first week. But anyway, I was that safe to be out of the installation, the military installation. Was it safe? Well, what I did was I uh, 
I lived in a, in a hotel right in the middle of Saigon, which uh, it was very nice there. It wasn't bad, you know. The buildings in Saigon are old because they go back to the French colonial period in the 1940s and 50s, maybe 30s. But anyway, um, in order to investigate what was going on with the instruments, I had to go visit the sites where the instruments were. And these were landing, what they call landing zones. They were a patch of real estate that the Army owned. Uh, they had helicopter landing zones there. And they would have beacon, this beacon on it with a certain frequency. And if a helicopter had to go to a certain location, he had to know that frequency so that he can home in on it and find his way there, especially when it got dark or it was uh, raining. Uh, and then there, uh, the Delta area, I found that the uh, problem uh, uh, was heat. I tried, I was given a, a technician that was who understood, who knew the equipment. I never saw this equipment before. But he knew the equipment and I asked him to disassemble it and uh, put, uh, and then I asked him to build a little canopy or, or uh, to shield it from the sun, but allow the wind to go underneath to keep it cool. We tried that and it worked for a while, but then eventually it still got hot and it would, what it would do, it was uh, cause a jitter in the, in the wave uh, which uh, acted as a jamming signal to all the radios that were operating around it, and uh, and that's basically why you went up. You went. That's to why I went yeah. out there ma mainly for also any other problems that they might be having. Like I ran into radio equipment which uh, required uh, uh, space between because they were too close together and interfering with each other, I had to give them advice as to where they should locate it, you know, stuff like that. But anyway, without the heat gun, I couldn't isolate the problem, but uh, I did go around and, and also uh, I found other problems with the equipment which I listed and I, I started to make a list. Uh, then I decided, to, I understood that the 1st Cavalry working in the Central Highlands uh, oh, we traveled by helicopter all the time, and uh, the Army did own patches of real estate, but I think the uh, enemy owned the rest of it, <laughs> because they were on their guards, sandbags, and everything. It was like a little fortress in each of these bases. Uh, uh, and it was at the uh, sea level, so that's where it was the hottest. But then I... Uh, I hitched a ride on a C-130 uh, transport plane or cargo plane uh, from Saigon to An Khe. An Khe is in the Central Islands and central to where the 1st Cavalry Division was working. Uh, they also had uh, isolated bases, uh, landing zones throughout the north there, uh, they owned the real estate on the, that the landing zone was on, but the enemy again owned the rest of the real estate. And I think their main job was uh, not so much to own real estate, but to just destroy the enemy as, as many as they could. I went, uh, I hitched a ride downrange on a mail helicopter. Uh, and uh, we stopped at several ranges and I noticed some of the equipment wasn't working, but not because of the heat. It was because it was designed for intermittent operation and they were using it continuously and parts were wearing out that weren't designed to be operated. Right. And so I had to list all these parts that I found were failing so that I gave it back to the contractor and uh, he could make design changes so that they could be worked the way the military wanted them to work con continuously rather intermittently. They didn't have a problem with the heat because they were about 1,200 feet above sea level uh, and, uh, and it was cooler, but their problem was overuse.
Mm-hmm. Use it. What a good job. Here, can you turn it around, Kathy, oh, so the good. camera can see? Yeah. Some of it shifted in flight, so we moved okay. it to make sure it was okay. Everything looking good in there? Yeah. All right. Where should I put it for you? I guess over there. All right, that's good. We travel by helicopter all the time, usually around 1,200 feet above an altitude. Uh, there was one time, though, where I had a thrill ride. Uh, there was a, They were having people taking pot shots at the helicopter uh, every once in a while. In fact, on three occasions that I was on, I could hear a loud report, but it didn't seem to bother the pilot because Plus, it happened all the time, and it never hit the helicopter. If it did, it hit it in a place where it couldn't do any damage. And uh, they found there was one trouble spot, I guess, a uh, 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 northern part of the Saigon uh, area, right after you leave the uh, town. And the uh, pilot decided that he should fly low. Right. Uh, nap of the earth, they call it. Uh, what do they call it? Nap of the Earth, NAP. They follow the uh, oh, okay. terrain. And he's doing 90 miles an hour. The door's wide open, and I took a picture of a cabin as we went by, and I could see the grass. Uh -huh, <laughs> yeah. at, we always travel with the door open, and the only thing that helped us in the, in the helicopter was a seatbelt that <laughs> we used. And sometimes it would bank. And I'd be, and the seatbelt be holding me. Wow. <laughs> and, uh, if it wasn't for that, I'd be flying out. Anyway, uh, that was that was an interesting ride. Uh, but otherwise, we traveled 1,200 feet until we came to what the, we flew over war zones. War zones were areas where fighting was going on on the ground, and uh, we would go up to about 5,000 feet. Daytime, and, nighttime. Daytime, daytime. 5,000 feet, because the uh, pilot would come uh, say, we're coming over in a war zone right now. And I looked down, but I couldn't see anything at 5,000 feet. Could you breathe okay? Or uh, no oh, oxygen? Oh yeah, because uh, when I uh, was testing the uh, drops on for the Air Force, I had to take a course in oxygen, learning what oxygen deprivation does to your body and I was in a chamber, uh, I took what they call a chamber ride in the Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, and uh, I was asked, the others that were with, uh, taking the course also, were had their oxygen masks on, I was asked to leave mine off and write my name as I was doing it. And, and at 18,000 feet, they told me to put my mask on, and I looked at what I was writing, I was scribbling. <laughs> Instead of writing, I thought I was writing my name, right. and uh, so I know that uh, I can't go up to eighteen thousand feet without getting dizzy or so, or losing consciousness. Uh, but up to ten thousand feet, you're required to uh, use oxygen in the Air Force. Uh, Five thousand feet is no problem. Oh, okay. Uh, what about the people there? You could tell some were in shape, and you thought they were VC. Yeah, well, what did you mean there by were some, there were some uh, guys that were from my own practice eye. They looked uh, like uh, they did some arduous marching or work or doing something because they were very strongly built as compared to the average Vietnamese there and I suspect very much that they were probably Viet Cong infiltrated and taking normal jobs uh, and, uh, and then when the uh, six months later when I left uh, they had what they called the Tet Offensive where they came in and they found that there were tunnels leading into Saigon and that's how they were able to get in there and surprise everybody. Oh, I see. And that would be a, one way for them to get in and out. Mm -hmm. And everybody was on mopeds? Yeah, what happened was the president of Vietnam, um, South Vietnam, uh, used some of the funding that 
they provided him for military operations uh, to purchase a number of uh, mopeds from Japan for his people to use for transportation. He must have made quite a profit on it. Mm -hmm. We didn't lose because I imagine he put the basic money back into use for defense. Uh, but uh, you see a lot of these things going around, these mopeds going around, people, some of them carrying televisions on them, other people carrying two or three members of the family on them, <laughs> but all on this two-wheel device. Right. And pollution level had to go up because these things really were smoky. And you brought something back for your daughter? Yeah, I decided to buy one of those comb uh, hats and a black pajama. They call the black pajamas. Uh, at the uh, local people, you could see them working in the rice fields uh, war mm -hmm. uh, for Halloween. And uh, what happened one time, I uh, put one of the hats on and I also bought one of these wooden things with the baskets to carry things. Mm -hmm. And I went outside with it, and everybody started, all the local population started laughing. <laughs> it, was, it was something that they thought was funny. Mm -hmm. And the roads weren't safe? That's why you went by chopper? Yeah, a helicopter was the only way to fly safely around there, and even that was sometimes questionable, but uh, it was better than driving on a road and having a hand grenade rolled underneath. Yeah, I never heard of that, but um, I did hear about IEDs, the roads were mined. No, they, at that time they didn't use them, they used uh, uh, hand grenades, they rolled them. Hand grenades uh, are around, you know, they could roll them. And you didn't know who was friend and who was foe? They, uh, it's impossible to tell. Okay. All right, uh, did we cover telephone, landline communication? It was a joke. The system that originally was there was probably adequate for the population. Uh, might have been strained uh, for the number of calls it had to handle. Landline, these are landline telephone calls. But then the military, our military comes in and uh, they have their telephone system. They patched it into the civilian system so that they could use the uh, power lines already in existence if they stretched their own, it would have been subject to cutting or or listening by oh, the enemy. So it was it was feasible to uh, connect into their lines and use their lines with the communication between bases. And that was uh, more secure. There couldn't be listening in then. It wasn't that secure, but then we didn't do anything that was uh, secure over the telephone. Was over there the like landlines a, over the landlines? Was yeah. there like a telephone company in Vietnam? Yes, there was, and uh, and we tapped into the uh, military tapped into their lines. Now, what this did was uh, overload the lines because, uh, and uh, you get a you try to make a call. Sometimes you got through. I had a call on K to coordinate my visit up there with the first cavalry, and it. It took me about 12 hours before I could get, make contact with anybody by telephone. Other times I would pick up the phone and it got through right away. If I got through right away, somebody else would say, when you get through, let me talk because I've been trying to get them for hours. Wow. And, uh, and uh, sometimes the signal was clear, loud and clear, and other times it was kind of garbled because of all the uh, other lines uh, interfering, I guess. But um, do you want to talk about the air traffic management system? I being that that was what I was working on uh, before I went out there. Um, I was curious to know what was being used now in a war zone, although it was a civil war, and uh, I found out they did the same thing uh, as they did with the telephone lines. We had air traffic control towers, uh, and uh, we had to work with the air traffic control system of the country that was in existence, being that we're using the same airspace 
which made sense. Uh, both military and civilian air traffic was flying in this airspace, so we had to share uh, the information about the flight so that we didn't have any collisions. You know, I never really knew that. There was civilian travel in and out of Vietnam by air? By air, yeah. Was it the same air bases like Tonsonu and things like that? Tonsonu and maybe Anke were the principal airfields. Um, I don't know how many, how much civilian travel went on, but the civilian, uh, there was a civilian aircraft that was taking our troops in and right. bringing them out. I knew that, yeah. So there was civilian air traffic. Uh, we, may, we probably used most of the civilian air traffic, but it had to be coordinated with the military because they had helicopters and they had C-130s and other cargo type planes uh, in the area flying in this same airspace. Let's talk about that you visited a new navigation system being used in Vietnam. Yeah, I had some time uh, in between my investigation for the of the beacon to uh, to visit a uh, new navigation system that was being used, and I contacted. Uh, I, this uh, officer who was in charge of it, and I sat down with him and taped uh, with a tape recorder what he had to say about the accuracy of the system. And uh, I, after I transcribed it and sent the report in, I had to report, write a report about every two weeks, and I have a uh, copy of the uh, memorandums that I had to prepare while I was out there and I sent back, mm -hmm. and uh, evidently this information was also sent to Washington to be coordinated. And when I got back and I had to go down to Washington uh, on the, uh, to find out something about uh, a facility for testing uh, communications for the air traffic control system, a fella asked me if I was, I wrote this article on the navigation system, the accuracy. I said, yeah, I, I, I had time. I, I was interested in seeing how accurate it was. He says, well, that's the only, this is the only information we have on how accurate the system is. And I said, well, gee, how come you didn't, uh, if you needed that information, how come you didn't ask them directly, you know? But, uh, so you're the only one that actually went to Vietnam to see how accurate it was? Yeah, I was As the only one out. that learned what how accurate it was, right? They and didn't send people out there to test it or check it? But or other people, I guess it didn't occur to him then to, to get that kind of information, you know. I was interested in it because uh, I'm in the air traffic control system business, you know. That's amazing. Okay. You hitched a ride on an Air Force plane to Bangkok. The what? Thailand. You went to Thailand. Oh yeah, I had a weekend there. Nice. <laughs> and I uh, visited uh, some of the shops. I got a 18 karat gold bracelet with black Australian sapphires uh, and an earring set for a hundred dollars. <laughs> uh, and I got that from my wife. I got a bunch of uh, other things. I got like uh, decorative swords, real swords. Uh, about three feet long and uh, dec very decorative for about three or four dollars and, and I got a, a jade necklace, uh, stone necklace, a couple of them I got for five dollars each and today I think they sell for a hundred dollars or more. Mm -hmm. but anyway, I, I put all of the stuff, plus stuff that I bought in the shops in Saigon uh, in a box. They told me if you put it in a box and mail it by boat they won't charge a duty. So I did that and, uh, and my wife, I told my wife uh, uh, I would be uh, sending it and she was waiting for it, waiting for it. finally it came. She says, it came. I was real amazed at what was in there, you know, it's like a, opening a Christmas present. That's amazing. Uh, and then when you left, I can't believe you stopped in Okinawa. Yeah, we, uh, the planes, I guess, uh, to save the f fuel that was in Saigon or, or Vietnam, 
they would come almost empty to Sa Saigon, fill up with troops that were returning home, which uh, I was on, and it would stop at Okinawa, I guess this, it would stop at Okinawa to fuel up because the Okinawa was a big air American base there and lots of fuel and uh, easier to get the fuel there than into Vietnam. And uh, they would load up the plane with the fuel in Okinawa so that it could make the one stop, no non-stop trip to San Francisco from there. Uh, uh, we got off the plane briefly, uh, but we didn't stay there long, only long enough for the plane to fuel. And as I got off, I said to one of the GIs, he says, see, the last time I was here, this place was really jumping. <laughs> then I told him it was during World War II, when, during the occupation, you know. What they during say? the campaign, rather. <laughs> what they say, so they felt like you were a they, fellow... They, were laughed, they laughed, you know. You were like them, a fellow combat. Yeah. Okay. Then uh, when I got to San Francisco, uh, I took a, a commercial, another commercial flight, flight to uh, Newark, and I asked the uh, stewardess uh, for a blanket because I was dressed for Vietnam, where it was very hot, and uh, it was cool on the plane. I wasn't used to that temperature, so I, I put that around me and mm -hmm. and. Uh, Stewardess said to me, "You smell like you came from Vietnam." <laughs> I guess so. She was and used to it. When I got home, uh, my uh, wife and daughter greeted me at the door and, and went back a little bit. Wow! I had to take a shower right away and take off my clothes and wash, get them washed, and then it was okay. You probably wanted to destroy your clothes, right? No, washing them got rid of all that. Oh, that's good. All, that. all right, speaking of clothes, um, let's, let's look at your uniform now that you brought. This is uh, a rank corporal. You see two battle stars. One is for Saipan and one is for Okinawa. I don't know what, I guess the ribbons are something about the Pacific area. Mm -hmm. This is when I just got discharged to, to indicate that I'm wearing the uniform, but I'm discharged from the infant. Oh, okay. It, That's what ruptured duck means. Yeah. Okay. This represents the fact that I was in uh, radar. Uh, I was a radar technician, which I didn't think, I didn't know that they were going to put that on a uniform. That's very interesting. Now this, uh, this is the, uh, I'll turn this around. Oh, thank you. This is the uh, patch that we had because uh, we were in China uh, when the war ended and uh, third amphibious. The third amphibious corps is uh, this three here. The dragon is that we were in China, and that's a China symbol. And the red, of course, is the Marine Corps color. Okay. And then your three stripes, that's corporal? Corporal. Okay. I got that right out of uh You can leave with. that, that's fine. And your cap, show your cap. Well, actually, I wore a different cap. I wore uh, the uh, one with the uh, uh, visor on it, you know. What's the uh, pin? Marine Corps globe and anchor? The what? Is that the globe and anchor? Yes, that's the Marine Corps globe and anchor. Okay, looks good. Do you want to wear it? That'll fit. <laughs> yeah, that's about the only thing that just about fit. <laughs> <laughs> and we cleaned up your uh, your dog tags here. Let's see if I have it right. Yes, I do. Why does it say Tet? It says T E T June 43. Tetanus? Oh, uh, I don't know. Oh, yeah, you have type O blood. That means you're universal donor, right? Yeah, you have I guess type so. O blood? Yeah. Do you give blood a lot? Oh, that, a tet I think is the tetanus shot. Oh, tetanus shot. Oh, that's the date you got it. Yeah, that's the date that oh, I got okay. it. Oh, okay. 
I guess that's very important to, uh, to indicate that you had that. You know? mm -hmm. All right. Actually, looks good. All right, so the, you have two sets of yes. your dog tags. Yeah, they really These are the stainless steel. Stainless. I see. Marksman? Yeah, not so much. Not, that wasn't a big deal. What does that say? I thought I had something written for that. Occupation service. That's oh, okay. uh, in China. That's very unique. Yeah, I've never seen China, that one. China occupation. Okay. Let's lay it down again because now the lights are coming on from the ceiling. All right. Presidential unit citation bar. Authorized by President Truman for those units participating in the Battle of Saipan. Red, gold, and blue. China Service Medal. Uh, yep, it says China Service. World War II Medal. That's the Victory Medal. I recognize. Wait a second. I'm on the wrong one. Okay. World War II Medal. That's the Victory Medal. <laughs> Is that your favorite part? Japan invasion canceled. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's your globe and anchor again. You can see the palm tree. Good job. I'm so happy you came back. Thanks, Art. Yeah.